Hey guys, we got in a, a few minutes late, but uh, thank you guys all uh, so much for coming. There are definitely some uh, familiar faces in the room and new faces, which uh, we look forward to meeting. But uh, welcome to How to Succeed in Pediatric Emergency Medicine Research Strategies on Funding and Mentorship. Uh, as I said before, I see some familiar faces, many of whom could be sitting up here with us, and, and feel free to provide your, your valuable comments as we go along. I put down the clicker mistakenly. I got it. I'll get there, I promise. We're there. All right, so our objectives today are to recognize the importance of mentorship at the local and national level for successful pediatric emergency medicine research, describe acting funding mechanisms, and then describe a potential personal pathway to engage with funding mechanisms and mentorship for PEM. Many of you know that there are unique challenges associated with pediatric emergency medicine research. This is fairly old, as you can see, in terms of data, and it tracks from 1992 to 2009 uh, the funding for, or NIH funding, for uh, research in, in general. And you could see the pediatric funding is the line that goes right through there. Uh, as a very small percentage of the overall funding landscape. And so I, I will say there have been some, some successes with some good advocacy in the last few years of increasing the budget for uh, pediatric research, but it's still certainly a very low percentage and still would continue to represent a similar percentage on this graph if we were to ex extrapolate it out to today. So PEM as a whole is a relatively young specialty. It's always interesting to me calling something a young specialty when it's about 50 years old or so or 40 years old, but that is is the case, uh, it is a, uh, and in combination with it being low funding, we felt like this session might help individuals uh, who are either uh, PEM trained or not PEM trained uh, get involved with research and, and give some tips and answer some questions on how to do it successfully. So for mentorship resources, we, we started to compile amongst us, and I'm, I'm sure some people in this room could also add to these, and you'll actually have an opportunity to at the end. Uh, national organizations, these are some of the places that we got mentorship from. The American Academy of Pediatrics, SAEM. I did the ARMED program uh, through SAEM as a pediatric emergency medicine trained person. I'll tell you, they were very welcoming, and it was wonderful. We did do lots of talking about geriatrics. I kind of tuned out of that, that a little bit. Uh, but uh, also, the Academic Pediatric Association does a speed mentoring at, at the Yeah, so it's, uh, oh gosh, what is it, the first initials? Research and methodology. Uh, so ARM, it's a program that I, I applied to when I was transitioning from fellowship to faculty. And what it was meant to do is uh, teach some basic research methodology, uh, as well as have interaction and grant writing uh, experts kind of look over your profile over the course of a year. And they had specific activities that we did. I will say the most valuable thing that I did through ARMED is I built an AIMS page all the way through it. And I had a lot of people have eyes on it that weren't actually pediatric emergency medicine and they were like, what the heck does this mean? What does this mean? Can you define that? And it gave me a great, uh, uh, an, another great set of eyes on some of the grant applications and stuff that I was putting together. Uh, and as an as a early career physician, it also launched me into getting involved in SAM more, like joining the research committee and such. So it ended up being a great program. Pretty, I was already doing this stuff anyway, so it was one of those things that it's like a nice combination of it wasn't extra work in which to do it. Uh, and they do it now for armed, I did the research specific one, they now have like educational research uh, as well for those who are more interested in that. Uh, I wish I remembered how much it actually was, but I don't. A couple thousand bucks, yeah, I think that's about right. Uh, so all of us got formal or informal mentoring through these national organizations. The National Research Mentoring Network, I have not actually applied to that myself, but uh, I've heard very positive things about it, uh, that people have engaged with that and it's led to successful funding. I think they've actually published uh, data that it's led to successful uh, research and funding uh, in the long run. Other specialty societies, so for example, I'll just throw one out there. I'm now involved in Academy Health because a lot of the stuff I do is health services research and implementation science, uh, and they seem to be where a lot of that mentorship uh, and expertise sits. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine fellowships are, are obviously fantastic. Robert Wood Johnson Health Scholars Program are also uh, alternative options. And then my favorite is a friend of a friend. 
Uh, this always happens uh, in, in pediatric emergency medicine and emergency medicine in general. Uh, I'm just going to give you an example. I showed up to a, a PEM fellowship conference, I, I can't remember how many years ago now, and I actually met Dr. Goyle, who's on this panel with me, and she said, you're interested in kids with, kids with complex disease? Oh, I know somebody who's doing that. And they weren't even in PEM, and she connected me with a group that has been extraordinarily productive in terms of research, like sort of building my own research portfolio and carving out a niche. So friend of a friend also is a, is a great way to go. For grant and funding research, resources, uh, the usual suspects are listed up top uh, that everybody often strives for uh, if that's what their uh, career goal is. And then society funding, SAM, EMF, APA, AAP, uh, SPR, I'm just listing off a lot of <laughs> acronyms I know. Society for Pediatric Research is the last one, American Academy of Pediatrics. Academic Pediatric Association, and these all vary in the amount of money that they offer, uh, as well as what the requirements are for the grants and also timing of the grants. I'll mention that later. Other foundation funding, uh, the CHA or Children's Hospital Association, Doris Duke, Robert Wood Johnson, Hood Foundation, Thrasher, and then also really, really important, especially for those who want to get some pilot data or pilot work done, uh, local grants are fantastic. Uh, they've been really helpful for me and my institution. For example, I'm using a local grant from my institution to fund a medical student for the summer uh, to work with me in between their first and second year, and they're going to do a part of my work over the summer, and that is really, really valuable. I think a lot of that comes through the previous slide of mentorship, both inside and outside your institution, uh, that can be really helpful. Like connect with this person who also has done that grant before. Uh, further consideration. So a lot of this is dependent on career stage. Uh, we represent uh, a varied career stage up here with the three of us uh, who are up here. Uh, some of these grants are at least for me, and they can comment, are hard to keep track of, to be honest with you. Like some of them are due in October, some of them are due in January, some of them are due in May, and then you get the announcement and it like gives me anxiety. Am I supposed to be applying to this? Uh, am I supposed to have some master spreadsheet that has all of these grants listed and when they're due and when their call for grants are? Uh, it does become overwhelming at certain points. Uh, and so again, I'll get to the resource at the end that we're trying to build uh, to help with that, but that is sometimes difficult to navigate, and I'll absolutely acknowledge that. And it's also hard, to, on the same token, it's hard to know where to focus your efforts. Like, should I apply to this APA grant, American Academic Pediatric Group, for $10,000, or should I be more putting more energy in the SAM grant that's $50,000? That's a real dilemma that I had at one point, so uh, that's why I'm using it as an example. Uh, but the, I, some of those become challenging. What I ultimately ended up doing, just you know, so you know, is I applied to the APA. Uh, uh, and then got rejected and got feedback from it and I got good feedback and then just recycled the grant uh, for another, another funding mechanism, which uh, rejection becomes a, a real part of my life. Uh, recently in the last few years. So this is who we actually have as panelists. I know we did this a little backwards with talking before, but uh, many of you know uh, Dr. Goyle is a pediatric emergency medicine uh, physician. She's the Associate Division Chief of Emergency Medicine Trauma Services and Director of Academic Affairs and Research at Children's National in DC. She's an associate professor, oh, you're a professor now. You're associate? I thought. 
She's Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Emergency Medicine uh, at GW. And uh, in 2022, she was named the first endowed chair of women in science and health for outstanding uh, contributions in biomedical research, which is a huge honor. Uh, Dr. Goyle's NIH-funded research program aims to develop emergency department uh, interventions to reduce disparities in both the provisions of emergency care and health outcomes for use, and she's actively involved in mentoring students, trainees, and junior faculty. I can attest to that, uh, and has a strong interest in faculty uh, development, diversity, and inclusion. And then Dr. Samuels Callow uh, is an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School and an attending physician in both emergency medicine and pediatrics uh, at Massachusetts General. Uh, she's been funded by the Charles Hood Foundation, a KL2 Catalyst uh, Medical Research Investigator, the Emergency Medicine Foundation, William F. Milton Fund, uh, and her work focuses on developing interventions to reduce disparities in emergency care and, develop, and designing strategies to use the ED to, vi to visits to address adverse social determinants of health. She has multiple current projects that are, that are ongoing to examine the role of individual and hospital factors in quality and equity of care for children in general emergency departments. So this is Dr. Goyle's funding. We like decided to stick up there what, what it is currently. Uh, if this was nothing else in participating in this, this was a humbling experience. Uh, so you can see that most of my portfolio is, uh, you can see this is like a more mid to uh, experienced investigator uh, where a majority of the funding is coming from NIH. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, early career investigator, obviously, so a lot of my stuff, this is like local, 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 uh, it funds most of my portfolio, and then obviously the, the K is uh, a great thing. And was fortunate to get that last August, and then uh, and then Maggie again is uh, very well funded with a lot of NIH letters up there that uh, we can get into a little later. But uh, I think at, at this point, I, one last thing I want to introduce before we just do question and answer and a conversation because I think that's probably the most valuable part of this. And again, with audience members who have been successful on this path as well, this could be a really great discussion. And we have this like wonderful round bowl of things uh, to have a discussion. So th what this is. It, this is a lot of the slides that I put together, and it's kind of put together on one resource. And what I hope this would turn into is I didn't really know how to advance it beyond to be helpful. So if you all look at this resource, it's a list of funding mechanisms uh, and grants and mentorship resources. I would be more than happy to update this or change it in any way that people saw as helpful to then be distributed. And it had been a few years when I was a fellow, I thought, wow, I wish there was a list in one place about where this all could sit so I had some idea of what to tackle. Although, like I was talking to before about the anxiety of trying to manage all of these different sources of funding and such, uh, it'd be really nice if we had a working document in which we could share amongst each other. So this was a good start to it. If you have any suggestions on things to add, subtract, or even a different way to format it, happy to do that. But for now, I think we should open it up to these wonderful uh, people who are joining me up here that I introduced before uh, for some question and answer. I do have a mic, but I'm not entirely sure we need that. Um, so I think it, I think it varies, um, you know, and I would say that now as a reviewer of, of um, K's on um, NIH study sections, I'm noticing it's, it's definitely becoming more and more competitive to get K's, and, and so the, the bar has, um, has definitely moved, um, and, and so I, I mean, I can speak from my experience. Um, I started writing my K my first year as an attending. And then um, I submitted it in my second year, and then my K was funded at the end of my second year um, as an attending. Um, you need to have um, 
you know, you need to have multiple first author publications um, and that are, that are, at least a few are in the area that you want to study. And then you have to have a really good mentorship plan as well as a career development plan. So, you know, I mean, I think um, it's a hard question because I do think it varies for everyone. Um, some people, I've seen some people able to write a K like right after their training. And again, I know your situation is a little bit different. You're not right out of training. Um, but, um, you know, for others, it, it does take a few years because again, um, there's, there is an expectation that there will be some preliminary data as well. So it, it also depends on how, you know, how much time it takes to get that, get that data. I don't know, Maggie, if you have any other. Yeah, I think uh, maybe not all of us have quite as elegant a story of getting it on the first try. And so sometimes it can also take a couple cycles to submit and resubmit. Um, and so one of the things to think about is like, what are you doing during that period of time that's supporting both you and your work? And maybe you're lucky enough to have some fancy departmental startup package, and that's amazing, but many of us are sort of scrambling for how to support our time while that's happening. And so thinking about um, a couple of potential sources of support in the meantime, right? Um, one great one are Foundation Career Development Awards. And so those are offered through SAM and through EMF, both for folks who are EM and PEM trained. Um, and they cover um, both a significant amount of protected time and then a little bit of pilot funding thing um, for uh, two years. Um, depending on where you live, there may also be regional foundations that offer career development awards. Um, so in between my K and my R, I had a foundational career development award from the Hood Foundation that bridged that like very, what ended up actually only being a six month very awkward period, but could have easily been longer depending on what happened with the R. Um, and so that was like life changing for me to have that like career development award. Um, and it's like Hood is the milk company in Massachusetts and they just like happen to fund some pediatric research. Um, so foundational career development awards can be a really nice option in that space um, to think about. And then there are also other opportunities to think about as well, which are institutional Ks, right? So a KL2 or a K12 is given to the institution, usually to your CTSA, and then they decide who to give it out to. And so often the competition's a little less steep, right? Because you're only competing with kind of your local people and um, they have to take a certain number of people in order to maintain the funding. And so they're very incentivized to fill those programs and so it's not that they're gonna for sure take you but your odds are much better um, in many cases than applying for a K08 or a K23 and depending on how those programs are funded if they're funded through NIH dollars they will decrease your years of K eligibility but many of them also have university money that kicks in and so if you can be on the university money side then it doesn't decrease your K eligibility and so that can be a really nice source of bridge funding as well and then the last thing to think about, which is deeply underused in emergency medicine, are mechanisms like diversity supplements. So if you have a mentor who has an R01 or a U, and they can write you on for a period of time, one to three years on the diversity supplement, that could also be that bridge as you're writing your K and collecting preliminary data to move independently. Um, so super proud of Monica for her like amazing streamlined version. Um, I had to resubmit mine three times, and it was like a long time to bridge that funding, um, which is part of why I feel like I have an intimate knowledge of all of these bridge funding sources as it went through. Um, but it, it is possible to bridge that gap. And then SPR, so Society of Pediatric Research, also has a bridge award. Yeah. Um, so if you've submitted a K and then, um, and then you need that time, right? To, because sometimes institutions might say, okay, we're gonna cover you for like, we're gonna give you some protected time for a few years, but then, then you're on your own, right? And so, um, and you may have gotten a, you may have submitted a K award um, and you have to resubmit it and then, and then you need the time to try to generate additional preliminary data or get some more papers or do whatever, right, to resubmit that K. SPR can, um, you can apply for some bridge funding through SPR and then they'll provide you with funding um, to then help you with the, with the bridge. This is gonna be about 50% helpful, that's about it. Uh, I, there is somebody in my group in emergency medicine who's a uh, sort of mid mid career individual, exactly like yourself, who wants to go into more of a research career because he does a lot of stuff with addiction treatment. Uh, there is a mechanism at NIH that I was frantically searching for on my phone. I wasn't just being rude. K twenty four, yeah. 
So that there is a specific mechanism, and I think there was even I, I found another one for him when he was asking at the NIH. So have you heard about these mechanisms already? Okay. Oh, that's great. Nate, please fill in for me here, but I'll, I'll just share, I'll share my experience. So, um, you know, I was, um, I, I had done my, completed my fellowship training at, at CHOP, just like the three of us here. And, um, and so I'm a first year attending. My, my interest was, um, or, and currently still is, a lot of my work has been in adolescent sexual health. And I was, as a first year attending, um, I got, very little protected time, um, and I was provided with an opportunity to be a site PI on a PCARN study. I, I had no idea what PCARN was. I mean, I'd heard about the acronym, but I didn't really understand it, um, and, and it was for Dr. Cooperman's DKA study, and, and I was like, I don't, I mean, this is not really in line with my research area of interest, um, but I think I'd be interested in working with PCARN in the future. Um, I, 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 I am a clinical trialist, or I'm, tra I'm learning how to be a clinical trialist, so maybe this will be a great opportunity, for, or good opportunity for me. And yeah, it'll buy me down some, it'll buy down some protected time, or provide me with some protected time. So, um, so I participated in that, and I will say, through that, I think the best, the greatest experience I got from that was um, finding a lifelong career mentor through uh, Dr. Cooperman, which was, which has been, you know, really wonderful for my career. Um, and what PCARN, so PCARN is, is, it's a wonderful research network, and, and it's over the last few years, I've watched it grow a lot, especially in terms of giving opportunities to, um, um, to, to investigators who are, who are kind of starting in their careers, their research careers. And so there's now a, um, Nate, I can't remember the name of it now. It's Emerging Investigators Program, or yeah, it's like what we call it. Not, we just call it young, but it doesn't. We don't call it young it's anymore. Just sort of junior or early career. Early investigators. career investigators, right? So they, so, so um, there's opportunities once a year where um, PCARN um, will bring your. If you're a PCARN site, then you can kind of nominate people. Um, to participate in this early career program where then you get to present your research ideas or your research, like your research project, and then you get input from established investigators within PCARN. And then there's also opportunities to then be able to participate in large multi-center research 
where um, you get exposure to, you know, to how to conduct large studies, but also um, opportunities for mentorship. So, you know, if there are, if, if you have an opportunity to get involved with PCAR at your own institution, I would definitely encourage you to do so. And there are other opportunities for network involvement. So both Kristen and I have done work through the Children's Hospital Association, um, which and as, as Monica, and so um, which is many pediatric hospitals are members of, and actually my hospital is not, but there's a hospital in town that is that we sort of like teamed up with, um, and so there's usually some way in. Um, and the nice thing about doing work with that group is that they provide uh, usually the data and the statistical support, so you basically get like shovel-ready papers at the end of it, and you get teams of like-minded investigators, so folks who are interested in firearm violence or health disparities or mental health emergencies or whatever can team up and do papers together, and that is an extraordinary really powerful way to move your career forward because you have the opportunity to be middle author on a bunch of other people's papers to learn how people think through a question and hear how they get feedback and how they respond to it to work with a team of different senior investigators and then propose your own paper to ultimately lead and so that kind of like I mean, I feel like group project gets like a bad name, but that kind of group project can really be a tremendous accelerator um, for your own work um, and in fact ended up being some of the like pilot data that we used in my R01 application ultimately. One of the biggest benefits of the CHA stuff is there's actually people who are not PEM in the, in the groups uh, who have expertise. And so where, where Mo Monica actually sent me over to the Children with Medical Complexity group, which is actually my area of research, and it's, a, it's mostly general pediatricians and hospitals pediatricians, and there's a pulmonologist, and that type of collaboration and mentorship from people even outside of PEM has been really, really great. So I, I think we're all probably would say that's a resounding yes, that it's a good resource, it, these networks are. And I will tell you, they're not that hard to penetrate. It might seem intimidating, but like you just, it's pediatric still. Like just start emailing and asking uh, and, and you'll, you'll land somewhere in, in one of the, if you have a good research question and you're motivated, it's not like, I know the CHA one is not hard to penetrate that to get into one of those groups. I just showed up because Monica sent me and then I, I said that I had a question about something and they said, okay, you're going to lead that paper and this is what we're going to do. Right. And then you started, you started the firearms. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And then I was like, hey, firearms are one of the leading causes of death in children. Like, why aren't we doing firearms as well? And they said, okay, send us a proposal. So now we're doing it. Like us, we're all your friend now, because you came to our session. So, uh, I feel like if I could do a K for the rest of my life, I would. And and the reason I say that is because. Um, you know, not because you absolutely need one to have a, a successful research career. Many people have had very successful research careers and continue to do so without K awards. The reason I say it is because a K provides you with 75% protected time to focus on your career development, right? It's not necessarily about the research study, right? No one's expecting you to like have your K research project be published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, but what the goal of the K is to focus on your own career development and, um, and R21s, um, R03s, R01s, they're about the research. They're not necessarily about building you as an investigator. So they're funding your time, but they're funding your time to do research, whereas a K is funding your time to develop your career. Um, so like I said, if I could, if I could be on a K for the rest of my life, I, I really would, because I would love to just immerse myself in, in, in lots of, like learning lots of different research methodology. But unfortunately, now I have to do that on my free time. <laughs> I just add one thing to what Mark said. Completely agree with Mark. So, so just to get an idea, on R21 or R34, and I could have both, typically your, your percentage could be 10%, right. 15%. Uh, it's not a lot of protection. It's really about the research project. Uh, 
I'll also say, I mean, I've, so I, I haven't had an R, I've applied for R21s, I haven't gotten them, but I've, I've, I've had an RO3, and, and now having been through kind of the different types of Rs, if there's an, an RO3 and an R21 um, is for two years, um, an RO3 is about $100,000, an R21 is like 185, I think. Um, and then an R01, of course, is, um, and that's total. I think an R21 is 185 total. Um, an R01 is 500 a year for, for or more, um, up to five, uh, five years. And so I would say, the, like, even though an R03 and an R21 are six pages, like in terms of your research strategy versus 12 pages for an R01, if you can convert, like if I would do it again, I think I would just focus on the R01 um, only because it's a lot, an R03 and an R21, it seems like it's not a lot, but it's still a lot of work for then time that goes like this and for like not a lot of money. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes whatever your research project is, like you, it can only be through a smaller grant mechanism, but if you can make it larger, I just think you'll get more bang for your buck. I had a question I thought of that I wanted to ask them that I didn't, I, I didn't really prep them for. Uh, I'm wondering, in your experience, because we talk, we're talking a lot about funding and that portion of it, but from a mentor mentorship perspective, do you guys have a couple, could you describe a few ideal behaviors of the ideal mentee and then the ideal mentor in pediatric emergency medicine? You don't have to name any names, but just maybe even behaviors that would make, that you feel like are really solid behaviors to make somebody successful in pediatric emergency medicine research. Look at their stumps. See, I didn't prep them for this. Let's see. Um, I mean, I would say <clears throat> having sat on both sides and continuing to sit on both sides. Um, now, I would say from a, you know, when, when you're trying to identify a mentor, I think um, in, in terms of identifying a mentor and then being a mentor yourself, I think there needs to be a level of selflessness, you know, and um, um, where the priority is the mentee. Um, and their, their advancement. Um, in terms of mentees, have, again, being on both, being, on, being a mentee and having mentees, I think what helps me and what's helped me the most is um, um, kind of um, coming prepared, like being prepared, coming with an agenda, like for every meeting, and being the one who's setting up the meetings, like the, the accountability piece, understanding that, um, my mentors um, are probably busier than I am, and um, and and so you know, coming with like an explicit ask um, and and kind of keeping things moving. And I think what's helped with, um, especially early in my career with mentor mentee relationships, is just having regular meetings because it keeps both sides accountable. Um, Yeah, I think those are great points. And I think that um, a couple other thoughts would be, we often, I think, as junior folks, hesitate to come with an ask because it feels like greedy or demanding or whatever. But I can tell you, you know, I'm like relatively early into my like sort of mid-career and administrative part of my job, but there is nothing more annoying than someone who's like, can we just have a meet and greet or like just chat? I, like the people who are my friends, I'm happy to chat with. But like, you know, if, if I'm having a meeting with someone, then like I would like to know what it is that they're hoping to accomplish so that I can like prepare to help them accomplish that thing, particularly if there's something I need to figure out ahead of time. And so um, it is really helpful if you're going to create that agenda to potentially be transparent about what that agenda is and what it is that you want them to do. And so, you know, we, I was helping one of my mentees try and find um, an additional mentor for her K award. And so she's like shopping an Ames page to a bunch of very senior people at our institution and having her be able to send an email being like, I want you to take a look at this Ames page. Here it is. This is the time frame. Means that people are actually like responding to her and they're able to say like, yes, I can do that because it's like a very clear, distinct thing that she's asking them for in a way that I think if she was like, can I just have half an hour of your time to like amorphously whatever, it'd be much harder for her to get that kind of response from them. And then 
I loved Monica's point about the like selflessness, and I think as you're thinking about sort of like where the rubber meets the road, like what does that actually look like? It's about you know being generous about time and generous about authorship, but also generous about personal networks. Like the mentors that I have had and like hung on to for dear life and like continue to love and appreciate are the ones who are connectors, right? And so they think about not only like who do I know now, but who do I need to know next? Who can I like collaborate with in the future and help me find like other people to work with moving forward and thinking about how all of us can rise together um, and become stronger as collaborators. And so thinking about, um, you know, we often make this kind of artificial distinction between mentor and sponsor, but I think the best mentors often have like a little bit of both in them, right? That they're thinking about who do you need to know and where do you need to be in order to take the next step in your career and how can they connect you to other mentees of theirs to help like those synergies and strengthen those teams. I just started this journey and I, in, in terms of mentoring, and I've already had some pitfalls, but, uh, and, and being a mentor. But one of the biggest things that I always tell people when I first start is like, I just would really love if you could stay present. It's usually the talk I have with them, uh, is stay present with me, like don't drop off into, into space, because that's usually the biggest pitfall that I have. But my K mentor, I actually have, I have every two week meetings on the books, and if I don't have an agenda, I just cancel that meeting. And she's like, thank you. Yes, it is scheduled, uh, and, uh, and if the agenda takes 13 minutes, it takes 13 minutes. If it takes 26 minutes, it takes 26 minutes, but that hour is blocked out, and she, I think, appreciates that at this point. It's better for everyone involved. Any other questions? Yeah, I think there's a couple of, you know, there's going to be the sort of obvious, like, follow the rules, listen to the, PA, like, you know, all of the sort of, like, things that you know. Um, but I think a couple of things that I didn't know that I, when I was starting out that I felt like I wish someone had told me is people are always like, talk to the PO. And I was like, the PO doesn't want to talk to me. I'm just some like early career investigator. Like, who are they gonna, you know? But actually the PO really does want to talk to you and they know all kinds of things that are not written in the RFA that are critical to know about. And so I'll give you an example, which is that we were writing um, an R01 that was due in May and we sent the Ames page to the PO, which is now my like standard practice. And she was like, oh, just wanted to let you know that actually we're not accepting health services outcomes for this R01. We're only accepting clinical outcomes. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, we forgot to put that in the RFA. <laughs> and I was like, oh, good. I'm really glad you told me this. But like, if I hadn't known to speak to her, I would have sent in this grant that was like completely non-responsive, right? Because, and we had a secondary outcome that was clinical, and all we did was like switch the order, and now we have this like totally responsive grant that we can send in with like zero additional work. But it is so, so, so worth your time to have them take a look at your AIMS page and tell you if they think that the institute's going to be interested. And they often have sort of an inside scoop on on what folks are looking for um, that can be incredibly helpful. What that means is that you have to be ready way ahead of time in order to have that conversation and be able to take their input in a good way. So I think best foot forward is making sure that you're responsive to what it says in the RFA. You know, they're gonna tell you what they're looking for, like use those words back, um, and making sure that the PO has looked at it and agreed. Um, I thought your point about the team is really insightful though, in terms of thinking about like, who do you need, right? And this is often a tension for early career investigators, particularly as they're either building out a K mentorship team, like who needs to be on that, or as you're transitioning to independence and you're thinking about who's gonna be on your first R, right? And those are, are two different sets of questions, right? And we can talk, I think both Monica and I are now reviewing Ks, and so we've seen like a bunch of these different structures for how to build a career development team and plan that we can talk through. But as you're thinking about that transition from the mentored award to the independent award, making sure that you are front and center, but also often that there's someone who's like had some experience with NIH and the track record on that grant so that people sort of 
believe that you can make that ESI to independent trajectory with like someone kind of backing you up a little bit can be really important in making that credible in that first R01 transition. Great. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is, and, and this is something I didn't pay attention to in the beginning and now I've started to a lot, is think about what study section and what institutes you want your, um, your grants to go to. And you can, you can designate that or you can request, I mean, I guess you can't designate, you can request, you can request. Um, but there is a place to do that um, because especially, like so institutes vary in terms of how much funding they have. And ICHD, sadly, has probably the smallest amount of funding. Uh, well, NAMHD, I yeah. Minority health and despair. I know. We, I like the work that I do. I'm just kind of like, of course, I'm going to the two smallest, like in, the, the two institutes that have the smallest amount of funding. But um, so, if you can span some of the wealthier <laughs> institutes, that's always good. Um, and um, and then think about the study sections that you want. So read up on that. You can always like Google is your friend, and there's like they have all the the, the study sections. What they're um, what their focus is. You can also look at the types of reviewers they've had in the past. I mean, you can't you can't ask for specific reviewers, um, like in terms of like I want Maggie, you know. Um, but what you can also do is when you're uh, putting in your application, you can say, um, especially because some study sections don't have a lot of pediatric emergency medicine physicians. So you can say, um, you know, you can request uh, for a PEM. Um, physician to review. They, they, won't, they may not always honor it, but you can at least make that request. So two quick notes on that, though. Um, if you're putting in a K, it'll get reviewed by a special K study section, so you don't have any control over that. That's just whoever the institute wants to review their Ks, so good luck. You know, that, that's like its own thing. But for R's and above, you can have um, a specific study section that you can request. And then if you're not sure, there's a bazillion study sections, they all have really like annoying acronyms, many of them start with Z, and it's just like very, it's like, an, it's not a very intuitive system. And so if you go into NIH Reporter and you look at grants that are kind of like the kind of thing you might wanna do, you can see which study section those grants have been reviewed in, and that's usually the best way of figuring out where your work might potentially get sent. Um, and then the other thing to know if you're a health services researcher is in the last two years, they redesigned all the health services research study sections. So you've got to look at grants that were funded in the last two years in order to figure out which are the relevant study sections moving forward, because otherwise you're going to get hopelessly confused. Yeah. And you guys, is everyone aware of NIH Reporter? Because that's a really good resource. Um, and that you can, you know, when you can, if you go to, if you Google NIH Reporter, basically it'll give you, it's a, I just wanted to say, getting the right formula, uh, the best grant I ever wrote was, was the K award, obviously. Uh, it got rejected, like, or derivations of it got rejected like eight times before, uh, not by the NIH, but by others. So I took pieces of it and applied to APA and SAEM. It got, I think in one year, I, 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 I counted it at one point. I think I applied to 11 or 12 grants. The only one I got was the K. So I got like very, I got a ton of feedback on these grants that I wrote or pieces of it and kind of, instead of getting discouraged, that is one thing is that this is really hard and part of me starts to think that there's a little bit of luck involved, if not a lot of luck. Yeah, so like my K focused on, on uh, kids transitioning on the NICU with medical complexity and when I looked at the study section that was on it, like 60% of them were neonatologists. So I have no idea if that makes a difference. I'm just saying it's like some of this is luck of the draw and the resiliency that if your mentors continue to tell you that th something's a good idea, this is a good idea, this is going to impact children positively in the future and you should continue doing this and that's what they did, it helped a lot with resiliency with me, I know personally. And it, it made me now develop a thick skin. So when I get a rejection from a paper now, I just, I'm like, I ignore it for like, I ignore it for like 48 hours because I'm just going to get annoyed. But then I go back and I do the same thing with grants. And then I go back and I read it and I'm like, listen, these are probably experts. They probably have good feedback that I can incorporate it into the next round. They're still telling me this is a good idea, so I'm still gonna stick with it. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to do the same thing. And as a mentor, I've been trying to do that too. Like, 
we might get rejected on this paper. It's okay, <laughs> uh, and it's uh, these things are okay. Yeah, I mean, and Christian brings up a good point. I mean, I, I, I would say that the secret to having a successful academic research career is perseverance. Um, I mean, it is, you, and you just have to get comfortable with rejection um, because, like, it is really, it, it is not easy. Um, this, this road is not easy, but it's extremely fulfilling, and you just kind of have to just kind of roll with the punches. really positive note. Yeah. We wish you all the best of luck in your research careers <laughs> moving forward. And thank you all very much for participating.